Please go green. Okay, we have one resolution coming out of executive session. Resolution 2015 BOE 47. Whereas the negotiating teams for the district and the Kingston Educational Support Professionals, NYSET ESP, executed a memorandum of agreement on November 30th, 2015 calling for the creation of a six-year successor collectively negotiated agreement to the one that expired on June 30th, 2011. And whereas legislative approval is required by the Board of Education in order to implement the funding of said agreement, now therefore be it resolved that the Board hereby ratifies the memorandum of agreement between the district and ESP covering the period from July 1, 2011 through June 30th, 2017, and authorizes the funding of those monies necessary to implement the provisions of the 2011 through 2017 collectively negotiated agreement. A copy of the memorandum of agreement shall be incorporated by reference within the minutes of this meeting. I'll entertain a motion. So, second. 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 Discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor of BOE 47, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Motion carries. And now we've reached the portion of the meeting where we have um, district happenings by Mrs. Kay Heidecker. Great, thank you. Um, before I go back, I just wanted to give a round of applause to our yes. beautiful musicians. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Barbara. that portion of the agenda where we welcome public comment. Uh, I want to remind you of uh, the parameters for public comment. Please approach the podium and speak directly into the microphone. Any order in which you signed up, if you did think to sign up. You're limited to two minutes. Um, Ms. Perna, our board clerk, will alert you when you're approaching the two minutes. It is not a conversation. It's an opportunity to support. And if you have material that would take longer than two minutes to present, you're welcome to leave it here for distribution to the board. So is there anyone who would like to approach the podium at this point to speak to the board? Is there anyone who would like to speak to the board? Going, going. Okay, well, 
with no takers. We'll continue. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Patalino. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shearer. Um, while there is a agenda there for superintendent's report, I do want to um, kind of go off agenda for a moment. If we look into, if the board looks at the consent agenda, you'll see um, under our personnel on P78, we have a, a notable retirement that I would like to just discuss before the board uh, moves on this in a few minutes. Um, you notice that our longtime principal, uh, currently of Edson, but had previously served in several other buildings in our district, uh, Mr. Bill Krupp has decided to retire, although I told him earlier that today that we were going to not pass that resolution <laughs> and we would like to have him stay. Um, he made it pretty clear that he thought it was time. Uh, I do, I won't embarrass Mr. Krupp by going through his whole career, uh, but I will say in the four years that I've been here, uh, Mr. Krupp has been one of the people that I knew I could count on, one of the people I knew I could go to to seek advice, uh, and one of the people I knew would give me, um, you know, the straight story on just about everything. I always, when I was a principal, I always say, if the superintendent doesn't know I work here, it means I'm doing my job. And I think um, I very rarely had to visit Edson. I liked to visit Edson. And those are the kind of things that make uh, a good principal. Mr. Mr. Krupp is um, a fantastic principal. He knows the job. He knows how to do the job. He made the change. He's been doing it so long. We, we changed how the position was, uh, was really thought of when it went from the days when I was a principal when you worried about lunch rooms and boilers and, and ordering things and buses uh, to being an instructional leader and working in the classroom. Mr. Krupp made that leap with no problem at all. He has the respect of his administrative colleagues and his teachers, and uh, I've, it's been an honor to work with him. Uh, he's one of those people that, as far as I'm concerned, you know, is someone that just kind of epitomizes what a great building principal and school leader uh, looks like and acts like. So I do want to congratulate Mr. Krupp on his retirement. I thank him for his service. I know many people have worked with Mr. Krupp and through the years and many people uh, have come back to him and now, now are grown up. Sorry, Bill, I know that's me telling everybody your age, but um, you know, he's really made a difference here in Kingston and made a difference in a lot of students' lives. So I thank you and I congratulate you and I was going to like have you come up so I could shake your hand, but I don't know if we'll get through everybody, so I'll come over there to you anyway. <laughs> I just want to thank the board and the community. This has been a dream come true for me. I've always wanted to be an elementary principal, even when I was very young. And I was so excited when Mr. Sioni hired me in 1989. And having worked in 27 years in four elementary schools has been a real blessing for me. And I think it's, it's had a great impact on me, as I know if I had on the staff I've worked with. We have a very dedicated community here of staff of teachers, of family members, of students, and I just feel very fortunate to be part of that. And um, I will miss what we have here. It's been very special to me. Um, and I certainly uh, am there for the transition, want to make a smooth transition, certainly for the successor of Edson School and the big responsibility that that person has. So thank you once again, and I appreciate your support over the years. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, we have a presentation from Mr. David Clegg from the Commissioner of, Commission of, Hum of Human Rights, who is going to talk to us about the restorative, just uh, restorative justice. He's going to make a restorative justice presentation. Um, just to give a little background, the board and the policy committee have been discussing um, the, some, making some changes or some additions to our code of conduct in the way in which we handle um, student discipline. And restorative justice has been the model that we've been looking at. So we welcome 
Mr. David Clegg. Thank you very much. I uh, feel honored to follow Bill Krupp, who actually taught my kids back in Zena School in 1989, <laughs> and uh, with very fond memories of that experience. It was a wonderful school, and he was a big part of it. So I'm here to talk about keeping kids in school, and it's a statewide initiative that is in some respects uh, uh, brought about by the judicial, Permanent Judicial Commission on Children's Rights, and it wants to keep kids in school and out of court. Uh, but what we're here to talk about is the disciplinary code and the effect that school disciplinary codes have on exclusionary tactics that may not keep kids in school. Studies have shown that school policies and disciplinary practices that employ exclusionary punitive measures often lead to schools directly and indirectly pushing students out of school. Suspensions, in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, all lead to very high risk factors for the students that have to undergo those disciplinary measures. This is from the, actually, the Judicial Commission for Justice for Children, and these statistics are telling. Uh, obviously, the majority of students suspended and expelled are between grades 7 and 12, just 3% of suspensions and expulsions in general are mandatory. In other words, a lot of this is a discretionary action on the part of teachers and school administrators that lead to ongoing and downward spiraling of a student. African American students and students with particular educational disabilities experience discretionary <coughs> violations more often. There's a disproportionate impact across the country uh, against persons of color and persons who have specific disabilities. And it's not to say that there's any direct intentional discrimination going on, but there is uh, an ongoing implicit bias that is just within the system. Kids sometimes come from places of trauma, places of poverty, places that don't fit within our white middle class focused education system. And it takes more than just punitive action to resolve that. Disciplinary actions increase likelihood of juvenile justice involvement, and I'll be showing you some graphs about that in a moment. All of the consequences of exclusionary practices are very much pointed toward punishment and not toward getting to the root cause of the problem. And what we're going to talk about is restorative justice approaches, restorative practices. And the, the key to restorative practices, which we'll get to in more detail, are that you try and get the person who's committed the violation or the harm to first acknowledge and then repair that harm. And it gives voice to the person who's been harmed. And it empowers the victim, which in the punitive system doesn't happen. The victim is often left outside of the box. And in a restorative approach, the victim is central in terms of repairing the harm and having a say in how that repair occurs. The unintended outcomes of suspension and expulsion are well documented, and it has led to what has become known as the school to prison pipeline. Um, we have both the Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice recommending that schools across the country undergo this, this work to, to redo disciplinary codes that were based on a zero tolerance uh, effort. Myth, there's really no evidence that a school to prison pipeline exists. The fact is, and once again, this is from our, our State Judicial Commission on, on Children's Rights, exclusion leads to lower academic achievement, higher truancy, higher dropout rate, higher contact with the juvenile justice system, lower local and state economic growth. Expulsion and exclusion from school leads to poverty, leads to dependency, leads to crime, leads to prison, pushes troubled kids out of school, onto the streets, into our community, and they're not prepared to move forward in life in a productive way. These are some of the once again, statistics that were developed by the Juvenile Justice uh, Commission. 
Young adults who drop out an increased rate of contact with the judicial system three times more likely. Youth with juvenile involvement at greater risk of future adult criminal conduct. And this is seven times more likely. And where does it start? It starts with discretionary suspensions. They're at an increased risk of contact with the judicial justice system just because of suspensions. That's where it starts. Restoration, not punishment. Restorative justice intentionally brings together persons harmed with persons responsible. It promotes dialogue. It promotes conflict resolution. It promotes accountability and responsibility for actions. It increases a positive school environment. I know that work is ongoing with positive school environment here. That PBIS is already in progress, right, Mr. Birch? Yes. And it's something where we're trying to, to teach students, and I'm glad all of you are here tonight, <laughs> teach students how to behave positively, how to make the environment in the school better, <coughs> more supportive, more friendly, how to build community among students and teachers and administration, and to collectively and collaboratively deal with misbehaviors and violations. So that the, the start of it isn't, let's punish this person, let's take them out of the classroom, put them in detention, expel them, suspend them, in school, out of school. The first thing is, let's address what happened here. Let's listen to each other. Let's dialogue with each other. Let's bring somebody who's skilled and trained in restorative justice practices, either as a mediator or in a conferencing that gets to the core root of the problem. Let's give services to the person who needs help. If it's a result of trauma, if it's a result of some family situation that's drastically gone downhill and that student comes in with a whole bunch of chips on their shoulders, you have to recognize what's going on and not just punish and not just exclude because that sends that person down the wrong road. The system works by integrating a cooperative system of prevention and intervention. <coughs> intervention, early intervention, is a big part of restorative justice practices. Let's get to the students, one, a positive behavior mold, and then if there is some activity where it's, it's violating some disciplinary code at some minor level, let's address it, let's get to the bottom of it, let's find out what's going on. <coughs> It does this by meaningful and effective assistance to a student to keep them engaged in the classroom, limiting the amount of time that a student spends outside of the classroom. That's the key. Keep them in the classroom and keep them learning. As I said before, I think one of the, one of the more important aspects of restorative justice is the victim is restored, is, re is repaired, has some ability to have a say in what should be done here. If you just get punched in the nose by somebody at school and then you don't see that person again and it isn't resolved, it's an underlying sting that stays with both the victim and, and an unfriendliness, right? It, it builds friction, it builds violence. Getting to the, to the root cause of it, and there's anecdotal evidence across the country that when you do that, not only do you restore and, and stop and break the, the chain of events that lead to more violence and harm, you stop the recurrence and you build a model where both people come out of it feeling that one, I've been responsible and I've been redeemed, two, that justice has been done in my case. So it helps both sides of if there's a, a two-person harm, obviously the entity could be harmed, the school could be harmed, but how do you redress that? You redress that by some kind of restoration, some kind of repair of the harm done. There A number of high schools across the country that have employed this very successfully. I've been to a, a number of, of programs that have run through the state. Uh, the Honorable Judith Kay, who was the, the lead judge on our Court of Appeals, is spearheading this drive and brought in high school people uh, involved in restorative justice from all over the country. <coughs> Oakland, which had some of the toughest high schools in the country, have had remarkable results. Denver, Minnesota. <coughs> Chicago, restorative justice rules have now been uh, implemented in, in New York City and in Buffalo. Uh, my last conference, I, I met a remarkable woman who's working at the 
Harlem Renaissance High School, and she was a dynamic. She was uh, not a dean of discipline, but a dean of restorative justice, basically. And so it, it requires both training and, and it requires a, an input of assets and investment and resources into this whole process. But you can see the most violent high school in the United States, they implemented, implemented and three years later, you had drastic improvement in the amount of misconduct, attendance approved, graduation rates approved, school climate approved. Now this is a difficult process that has to be undergone through the administration and through the teachers and through the students. But once everybody gets on board, there's almost unanimous acclamation that the school environment improves, that attendance improves, that graduation rates improve, that, the, that there's a positive environment created at the school, that the community builds, that the students are happy, the administration is happy, and, and the teachers are very happy, that their classrooms are more structured and more, and the behavior is much better across the board. So these are experiences that other high schools that have implemented this have had across the country, and there's a great deal of, of evidentiary social science background on this that supports moving ahead with a restorative justice approach. These are some of the areas that restorative practices get involved in. As I mentioned before, there's collaborative negotiation, conflict resolution. That can be done just by a teacher bringing students together. The, the starting of this process, as we talked about, is training. So the teachers and uh, there will be specific people, depending on how you do this and if you do this, that are, that are intensely trained to facilitate this, but it will be a staff-wide approach. And so you can have teachers doing uh, conflict resolution. Restorative conferencing is somebody specially trained <coughs> for conferencing peer mediation with students that are trained to deal with these issues and bring students before them and they get involved in how do we repair, how do we have a plan to repair the harm and, and what do we need to do to bring this back to a positive level. One of the keys is that a disciplinary violation is a teaching moment, and to take that moment and use it for a positive result, as opposed to a punitive result. Circle process is something that's done throughout the country, and it's done mainly with people that, or students that are at high risk, students that have had a great deal of difficulty, students that other means of, of restorative practices have not worked. And that involves a collaborative effort of not only staff, but family, community members to get together and actually a support group for the, the student that, that needs the help and develop a plan. How do we want to support this student? Teach the student that you have gifts that you don't even realize, that, that you can succeed in this school, that you can succeed in life, and that you can be brought back into this community in a way that benefits everybody. And that support group develops a plan and then follows through with it. And it can be, as I said, followed through within the school and outside in the community. Mentorship is also another possibility, either with fellow students, other teachers, other persons from uh, within the school system or without the school system. Four stages of restorative measures implementation. The first thing that is a decision, is the decision, do we go forward with this? Is this the right thing? Is this, is this the right thing for our kids? Is this the right thing to build a school that's more positive, that, that has better graduation rates, that, that has a feeling of community and support throughout both the student body, the administration, and the school? Do we want to make that plunge? And if you do, you start with developing a disciplinary code. I know your subcommittee has started to look at that. And there are, as we said, there are models that we have. There's a model for national uh, schools for disciplinary codes. There's also models that we can use for New York City and Buffalo and Rochester. And you can actually pick and choose those things that are most favorable in your climate, in your school system that you believe will work. Uh, it's not something that has to be 100%. You can use it with disciplinary, obviously disciplinary measures will still be in place at a level. What you want is it's the least restrictive harm occurring the least restrictive punishment in each occasion. There are occasions where you still have to punish students, you still have to suspend them, you still have to expel them. Hopefully those are far and few between. But it is, it is a drastic event which you try and avoid at all costs. 
as we talked about before, training staff and setting up infrastructure is the next step. Uh, there was a pilot program started in Minneapolis. They taught all the staff, all the teachers, all the administration. They all went to some training. And then they selected specific teachers who would get more intensive training. And then each school would develop someone who would be in charge of that particular area. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Dr. Palatolino, I know you'd be very skilled at figuring all this out. It takes visionary leadership. It takes visionary commitment to this program to make it work. But those high schools throughout the country that have done it have all recommended this as a positive event. Then you adopt it and you, you implement it in each one of the schools. And part of the uh, important process here is not only doing it, getting everybody on board, but once it's done, record keeping is very important. Let's see what's working. Let's see what isn't working. Let's move forward because the process continues and once you've done it, you're finding things that are, are remarkably good and you're finding some things that aren't working. So you, it's an evolving process. But it's one that can lead to better schools, better education, and, and keeping in children that are at risk that would otherwise be lost. So thank you very much for your time. Mr. Clegg, are you going to take questions? Uh, I'll be happy to. I'm just thinking I have. I'm sorry. Um, do, do any of the trustees have questions? I, I did bring some copies. Okay, good. For Mr. Clegg. Uh, <coughs> okay, Dr. Jacobowitz. Yeah, it's on uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. excellent. Yeah. excellent. Yeah. That's a little different than what you said, George, right? Because we all have it. Yeah. Yeah. You all have it. Okay, so I can. Sure. Yeah. If, if anyone would like a hard copy, uh, there's 14 of them here. Okay, Dr. Jacobowitz has a question for you. Um, yes. When I think of, of restorative justice, I think about it as a, a reaction. So, there, so there's an offense, and then the way that it's dealt with is through this restorative process. But you mentioned a prevention piece, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more as it applies to the restorative justice kind of um, theory and philosophy. Re restorative justice works within the, the positive behavioral systems that you are now starting to put in place. Uh, it, it requires, one, that students are, are taught how do we create a positive environment here. Not just don't carry a gun or a knife into school, but what do I need to do to make this a better school? And, and they're encouraged to act in that fashion. So in that process of creating a positive environment, you also have opportunities to learn that certain students are having problems. And so early intervention with that behavioral uh, inadequacy, uh, whatever it might be, is the most favorable way to, to treat it. You know, if you catch it early, you can deal with the issue easier and quicker and stop it from mushrooming into something more serious. Uh, there are all kinds, as if you look at the disciplinary codes from, from Buffalo and New York City, there are levels. Generally, there are tiers of, of infractions, you know, and they get more serious. Uh, you have interventions that are more serious. Uh, and it's only in the bottom group that you ever talk about out-of-school suspensions or expulsions. Uh, and still, you have to employ every process that you can come up with to deal with it, including some kind of support for this child. What do they need? Do they need some kind of counseling or psychological help, uh, medical help? whatever it is, uh, some involvement with the family, the circle process, all of those things can be selected. And once again, that's, that's the process, and, and you try and save this child from being outed.
I have a few more, unless other people do. We'll come in. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I've heard of this process being used in high schools, and I'm wondering if there are examples of elementary schools, I'm assuming also middle schools around the country, but if you're seeing it really in the younger grades is really what I'm interested in. Now. Yes, uh, and each, once again, uh, Buffalo and, and New York City, which I've looked at, both cover elementary all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the, the reactions to behavior are different for youngsters. So, in other words, I think it's New York City. You cannot expel a child who is 12 years old or under. They just will not do that. Uh, and uh, out-of-school suspensions are extremely limited. So that those tiers, once again, are, 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 are more generously restorative at those earlier years. But it's always the emphasis in each of those codes to, to bring a restorative practice to address the behavioral abnormality, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I think a comment. I appreciate uh, Dave coming <coughs> and sharing this information. And I think that what he's trying to encourage us to do is to be proactive in uh, cutting down on the number of suspensions. And as he pointed out, throughout this, not just out the state, but, but throughout the country, there's this disproportionate number of, of uh, children of color, of children who are on special ed, and et cetera, that are being put out of school in a disproportionate number to the other students. And one of the things that um, I think impacted me is that a lot of schools, and I don't know how many, whether we've been cited in many buildings or not, but in many schools they have been cited for this. And what they're doing is that if you're cited for disproportionality, the end result can be that you can be fined. We, we looked at one school in the, uh, when we were at the conference, and I think they were from Indicott, and uh, they were fined like $130,000 for uh, because of that practice. And it may not be intentional, but that makes no difference mm -hmm. if, if the number of children that are being suspended from school is more black males than white male, or if it, two children uh, are, uh, have done the same act, and one is a boy and one's a girl, and the girl remains in school and the boy gets two days suspended, that's disproportionality and can bring a, a, a site to school for, for doing that. So I think it's important for us to be proactive so that not only will we do the best for our children, which is keeping them in school, and we know that. We have attendance policies. We're encouraging and trying to increase the, uh, the attendance of all the school, children in our school. And yet when we do a, a, a process as we're doing now, we have children who are out of school for a considerable amount of time, and sometimes not for... Uh, you know, violence in the sense of guns and all of that stuff, but sometimes just for uh, the, their indicated that they were was disrespectful to the teacher and not that we, you know, condone that, but, but many of the things for which they are put out is, is not something that they shouldn't be in school and getting classes in to do. So I think that it's a challenge for us to be proactive in our approach to uh, uh, reducing uh, suspensions. And um, they, I know we've had you at our uh, policy committee, but uh, do you have any uh, sp more specific things that you can say where, uh, how we get more people involved in this uh, within the school district and within our community too? Because you did a lot of talking about students, teachers, etc., but we didn't hear much about parents. All right. <clears throat> well, it is supposed to be for it to work, a collaborative effort, a multi-system effort. Uh, so you have the administration and the, the teachers and the students all are part of it. The parents, of course, have to be brought in. Now, exactly how we reach out to that, maybe PTA meetings, I don't have uh, any specific uh, ideas about that off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's ways to do that. Uh, as we talked about, Jim is also on the Human Rights Commission. We have a platform from the Human Rights Commission to start talking about it, start having press conferences about the need for children's justice that these issues might affect. Uh, we could have open forums on these issues. Uh, we've talked about doing that also. But once again, I think it's, this is, a, this is an issue that affects a broad array of our community. The juvenile justice system is involved in this effort. Uh, the judges from the family court should be involved in this effort. 
the district attorney's office, and, and Mike Hine, who's the county executive. All of these different institutions within our community would be supportive of this as far as we, we've had a conference, as you know, where we brought in people from all over the state to speak on these issues, and there was almost unanimity amongst those who attended that this was a good idea and was supported uh, by the DA, by the family court, by the public defender system, by the probation department, by my kind. So uh, we have a lot of support that's building on these issues. I think initially the school board has to decide, are we going to move forward with this? And if you want to and, and, and you've committed to that, then I think we can marshal support behind it. And certainly parents and the community have to be part of it. The community is an important aspect because we can add to your uh, ability to deal with these uh, issues in a restorative manner. Uh, churches can be involved in it. Uh, and other community agencies that want to support this and, and are working with, with kids. Family of Woodstock, I'm sure, would support this. And I'm sure there's, there's uh, different groups throughout the community that would be available to help us and help you and help the school system. Mrs. Collins. Um, thank you. I want to first of all thank Mr. Clegg for his generosity with his expertise and his time. On behalf of the policy committee, uh, he's met with us on several occasions. He's given us an awful lot of good statistics, good suggestions. I also see that Mrs. Evelyn Clark is here tonight, also on the Human Rights Commission. Um, she's come to a couple of our meetings, and I think that that is indicative of, as you had said, it's not just a school problem, it's a community problem. Uh, or it's a community issue, shall we say. Uh, it keeps ringing in my head. Um, it's as you were saying too, uh, Mr. Clegg, that um, disciplinary, the disciplinary interactions are teachable moments. And it's a whole uh, shift that we have to embrace. And I know that several of us, not only on the policy committee, but on the board as well, when we attended the NISBA, the uh, State School Board Convention, had attended some of those seminars on the school to prison pipeline. Uh, several of us went to SUNY New Paltz a couple of weeks back um, to that seminar as well. So I think that we do have that commitment here, um, and I just want you to hear that as well. And it is a shift, and it is going to take community support and also a change in our thinking. But you've been very generous with your time and expertise, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Shawson. Just, uh, if I could make a couple comments. One, I think... Um, at, at George Washington School, which is our Montessori school, they have a peace rose, is that yeah. what it is? Which is sort of a, a um, restorative justice method of conflict resolution that's introduced you know, at early elementary ages. Um, the second comment is that you know, for the school board, as we, and the district, as we approach a higher level of graduation rate, it's going to be more difficult to get those up at those increments at the upper at the upper percentages and unless we adopt a restorative justice model to keep kids in school uh, because those are the ones that aren't going to graduate and that's our goal to get to 100 percent graduation um, and I think that a restorative justice model is is necessary for that. Um, and the third com quick comment, we're going to be considering a resolution later today in our, uh, about <coughs> community partnerships um, and uh, social and emotional health of our students. And I think that this will be an important component of that. That's wonderful. Um, so I, I agree with the comments that have been made, and I, I think I think this is important. I think it's important to keep our kids in school, and I think this this is a um, kind of a great method for doing that. And so I would like to see us move forward with this kind of program in our schools. I would also like to see us move forward with something like this. I think uh, sometimes um, because we understand what's going on with <coughs> night school suspension and and in school suspension being offered, but Families don't always understand exactly what's going on and how important it is for the families to get involved in something like restorative justice and actually support their children to choose that rather than being suspended out of school, which 
isn't good for anybody. All right. So I want to thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Fife. Okay, um, young man in the New York City shirt, I'm making you the spokesman for the young people here with you today. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Where are you from? Uh, Coleman in Houston. Okay, and what do you need to do here tonight? Uh, we're writing a paper for our uh, government class. We're supposed to uh, come to a board meeting and uh, write about things that are going on in the district. Do you need signatures or proof that you were here, or is your work enough? Yeah, we got them ready. Okay. Very good. We want to make sure you were taken care of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, part of Superintendent's report is uh, KSQ and BBL. We'll do our second century project update. Good evening. Um, we're here at uh, BBL and KSQ to provide uh, the monthly update on the Second Century Capital Plan project at the high school. Uh, we're going to start tonight. My name's Robin Skrdanis. We have Mike DeLima from BBL and Scott Hilgey is from KSQ Architects. Um, we're going to start tonight with the pre-construction design progress updates. Uh, and Mike will speak to that. Oh, how you doing? Um, well, we're building the Salzman additions that are finally coming out of the ground, and Robin will talk about the construction part of that in the uh, latter, latter half of the presentation. But the other big portion of those additions are the fit-up. And the fit-up, again, would be the interior walls, flooring, lights, mechanical systems. It's almost been a year since uh, we collectively, our office and KSQ, submitted to the state ed for review and approval. And uh, the architectural comments have been provided and returned to the state. Uh, the MEP portion, which is always uh, the, that takes the longest of to get to an approval stage, is uh, upon us for a review. Uh, SED has reported that they're mid-December to commence that process. Based on some historical uh, time frames of their review and response, we're probably looking at a mid-January to get uh, comments, and then the design team will address them. So we're figuring we're into uh, the middle part or a portion of February will have SED approval to go out in the streets uh, to bid. Uh, once that takes place, that'll be the last big part of uh, the additions and all the bid packages that come with that to finish out those uh, portions of the project. Um, that'll take a couple years to do, but it, it'll still remain on track from when we're turn, turning over the additions and the renovations to the district uh, within the timelines we pre previously provided. The main uh, heat <coughs> system package, uh, that is a package, and again, which we submitted to State Ed in uh, September of this year, and that's to do some prep work. It involves abatement and some heating distribution systems related to the boilers. Uh, the state is in the eight-month review time frame for that, so we're anticipating a late spring approval. <coughs> Subsequent to that, we've uh, looked at uh, generating a, an abatement package, which allows us to uh, commence that work sooner because the state will only take uh, two to three months to review those packages and we'll go into the existing buildings and remove uh, lead line ductwork and the uh, asbestos uh, pipe insulation. All prep work for when we do have an approval on the MEP portion, we're able to commence work over the latter part of the summer. Once we have that approval on the abatement package, we should be mobilizing on site and commencing during the summer work periods when the kids aren't in school. Um, that's the last uh, couple bid packages here for uh, the first phase of work for the district. Uh, the main renovations package, which is primarily the second phase of work, uh, KSQ is uh, wrapping up those documents. We should see it shortly after the new year. What that allows us to do is then uh, put an estimate BBL's office to that scope of work and then compare it to the referendum scope and the funds allocated for that secondary phase. We'll regather as a team to go down the list of items included in that, time frames, uh, dollars, and we'll make adjustments from there. Um, and that'll essentially uh, address all the items on the referendum that the voters uh, approved uh, a few years ago. Um, lastly, but not lastly, 
We're continuing to work behind the scenes. Our office in KSQ, we review the documents that are on state ed's uh, possession. We're trying to always fine tune them, make them better. We get smarter as we go along and make adjustments to those documents, all with the intent of making them as clear and concise uh, when the bidders obtain them in the next couple months uh, to put a real value to them and we can award contracts. <coughs> Uh, we're re-estimating uh, the FIDA package to make sure nothing's changed since it's been a year uh, since they were completed. Uh, we continue to converse with contractors. Um, spoke to a few today, just they called out of the blue, are we close to the FIDA package? So there's some good interests out there with the uh, bidder market. Um, we continue to hold uh, project team meetings, uh, from design meetings, on uh, documents that are with state ed, to revisiting uh, the existing salesmen and rethinking, re-looking above ceilings to make sure we haven't forgotten something. Um, there are many facets <coughs> of that interior renovation that needs to take place, uh, structural steel reinforcement, temporary egress, uh, things that uh, relate to district phasing requirements and SED requirements. Um, so we're continuing to work behind the scenes in those items. I think those are highlights of our pre-construction efforts at the moment. So now we have our construction updates. Um, we're doing um, two projects currently on the site. One is at the field house. Um, I'm sorry, Robin, could you use the microphone? Pardon? Could you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. For the millions watching at home. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, me nervous. Um, okay, so we have the updates for the, um, for the field house construction. Currently what we're doing is the uh, mechanical work is, is finalizing itself in the lower level. Um, as you all know, we are scheduled to turn over the lower level locker rooms on January 4th in just a month from now. Um, partition walls have all been constructed at this point. Finishes such as tile work, painting, epoxy flooring, all of that um, have begun. And then the addition itself has finally been um, the original has finally been demolished in its entirety, and right now we're undergoing excavation for the new 12,000 square foot addition, and we are hammering rock, a lot of rock. So I'm sure that anyone that's on the high school campus has probably heard of the hammering of the rock behind the field house. Um, that's going on. We, we expect that to still continue to take a, um, a couple more weeks. As a look ahead, upon completion of that excavation, um, then we can, um, oops, messed up. Upon completion of that excavation, uh, then we'll start with the footings, the formings, the rebar, the reinforcing, all of that other stuff, and do the um, footprint of the addition. Uh, we are installing this Saturday the new transformer for the electrical on um, off of Andrew Street. Uh, we will continue with the finishes again, all in anticipation of turning over that lower level on January 4th. You can see some of the pictures here where you'll see some of the new bath room areas, shower areas, the tile work that's ongoing, the paint work that's ongoing, the sheetrock. Um, we're putting in the new lighting. Um, this really doesn't, it doesn't give you quite as good an idea as if you were there, but it is getting close. It is getting, it, it's getting closer every day. Um, and then again, here's a couple pictures of the rock excavation. Um, we've had to bring in uh, additional equipment to do pre-drilling excavation along with the hammering to do the rock removal itself. Um, and we anticipate this again to take a, a few more weeks to move along on the South Edition. On the early package, the Salzman, which includes both the East Edition and the West Edition of Salzman. Uh, the footings, reinforcing um, with concrete, all of that, um, except for at the very north end of the East Edition, for the East Edition only, is complete um, at this point. They currently have the forms up for the foundation walls along the south and the west side of the east addition. Um, and we <coughs> started trenching for the new water lines, gas lines, electrical that'll go down the service road. And we also um, completed the installation of an access door at Tobin and a bus loop for um, the buses that go just for the delivery of students to Tobin itself. As a look ahead, um, tomorrow, tomorrow's Thursday, yes. Tomorrow we're going to pour two 
75 foot lengths of the foundation wall of the east addition and on Friday we'll pour an additional 75 foot length of the west wall and south wall of the east addition. Um, as soon as that's done and they have time to cure, then they'll strip all those forms off the west side and use those to put up the east side to form and then we'll um, continue to move around the building uh, for the foundation. Upon completion of that, they'll backfill. Everything will be all hidden. After we did all this work, you won't be able to see it except for the very tops of it. And then um, we can start again with the, with the structural steel, which at this time we're still anticipating around the third week in January. Although um, we're considering, we're looking at the schedule to see if indeed it would be worthwhile to push it one extra week so that um, there's no noise during Regents. Although what we're doing now is we're finding out from the vendor just how much noise they would anticipate or how much disruption the startup of the first week of structural steel will be. And then we'll get back to you on, on or we'll get back to the administration on how we're going to do that. Um, here you go, you can see the formed foundation walls of the west side of the east addition as well as all of the concrete and the reinforcing that's been placed on the east walls and the columns and the piers that are also formed. Uh, you can see where the water line trenching is going down the service road. Again, they're bringing in a bigger machine because it's all rock in that service road. So that's going to be a little bit noisier over the course of the next week. We expect that water line uh, trenching to take place over the course of the next two weeks or so. Here's a site photo. This is looking off the hill from MJM down toward Andrew Street. This is the south end of the East Edition. And this is a total uh, a, a site photo looking again from MJM, which picks up the south side of the uh, field house, as well as the east addition. You'll notice that there's nothing um, yet built on the north end of the east addition, which is where we're actually starting our structural steel, because there was a slight redesign, the need for micropiles. And at this point, we're just getting the final review of the new design for the reinforcing bar that has to be used for those walls and columns. And then um, we anticipate approval of that by the end of this week. And the start of that whole end and that concrete and foundation and footing work um, within the next week or within the next two weeks or so. It's getting exciting. And we can actually see the outline of the building now. Once the foundation walls and everything go up, you'll get a sense. Keep in mind that this east addition is going to be four stories high. We'll start putting in the structural steel on the north end. We'll do two floors at a time, then we'll go up. We'll do the next two floors, then we'll go south. Do the first two floors, then go up and do floors three and four. Uh, and then we'll start to move over on the west side and start it all over again to do the west edition. Questions? Questions? Thank you for all that information. <coughs> it, is, it is exciting. And this might be for Dr. Padalino more than you guys. But um, we haven't heard anything. I, I haven't heard anything from the high school population until today about that drilling. And, um, and it's, you know, necessary evil. And um, maybe it's good that we're doing it right now before the holiday. But um, I guess my question seems like Mr. Schieber and Mr. Reinhardt seem to say that people could relocate if possible. So I'm assuming minimal I was, disruption. We're I, was on, that. I was on campus today um, at the high school. And uh, from about 11 to 12 or so, um, and walked over with Mr. Reinhardt to see if he, he did have two specific complaints from two teachers. And when I went over to where this was going on, I completely understand why they had the complaint. Their classroom was, you know, adjacent to um, those pictures must have been taken a few days ago because the machine that was hammering today that I saw was three times the size of the one the picture you just showed. Um, and the ground was shaking when I got out of my car in front of Carnegie. So it was, that was a large piece of equipment. Um, 
so Mr. Reinhardt did, you know, move those two teachers, and but he did put out to everyone, you know, if they needed to, m you know, make some changes in the classroom, he and he and the administration would work for it. And, and actually, as of about noon today, no one had asked that. On top of that, I will also let you know that we do have our, we, we are also undergoing our Kingston High School review today. So we have, um, we have our outside educational expert in the building who is <laughs> conducting our DTSDE review. So that's. Um, just hey, you know, it's all, it's all in a day. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we had two two complaints. They were legitimate. And, you know, they, no way they could have worked in those rooms. They're moved. Other people were given the option, and no one else took them up on it. So I think people are coping well. Like I said, I, I spoke to probably 15 people as I walked through the high school today, um, and no one said anything negative to me about what was going on. It was mostly positive, and actually, I spent a few minutes staring out the window with a few teachers watching the um, the other giant machine that you don't have in this picture pulling out a piece of rock from behind Kate, yeah, Kate Walton Fieldhouse. Yeah, there is a, there's quite a few large pieces of equipment and the one probably that you're referring to was just delivered today because the equipment that they had been using up to this point hadn't been as effective as they needed it to be. I'm just, uh, I'm satisfied with the work I see you're doing. I'm just concerned uh, with the coming of winter and the cold weather stuff you will prevent you from working outside, doing outdoor work at Corn Sea Net or anything else. So. No, the, the cold weather won't, won't prevent us from, at, at the time where the temperature will be that low, we should be mostly working on, on swinging steel which won't be affected by it. The size of the addition in the, um, for the field house, we can use additives and protection for the concrete, et cetera, and still continue to move it along. I know when I first started construction, you had all winter off, right? I don't know what I was thinking. Now it's year round because they've come up with methods to be able to do it year round. Yeah, I, I think your question is asked. I think it's answered, but I think it's important to note too that Mr. Reinhardt sits in the steering committee, and whatever's going on, he's informed ahead of time, and he's able to <coughs> collaborate as to whether that's going to work or how it's going to impact. And he has said that he's been very, very pleased with things so far. I was just worried about space. <coughs> it's not always easy to relocate, but um, I appreciate their flexibility. I'm sure everybody does. Um, I have a question about a process question. Um, so I looked at the change management um, blog that was included in the package, um, and I, it looks like right now there are three items that are over fifty thousand dollars, and I think the procedure is that 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 they require over fifty thousand dollars requires board approval. Is that right? Is that what we agreed to? Yes. Yes. So how will that work? At what point will it come to the board for approval? I think it will come to the once we get the paperwork from BBL, it will come to you with the change order request at the next meeting and we'll approve it. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. It was very pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, that it, that concludes the superintendent's report for today. Thank you. Okay, and now um, I'll have to return to the agenda and apologize because I departed from the agenda before the superintendent did. Um, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes on the deliberation. So, so moved. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion. Any amendments? Addition? Okay. All those in favor of the minutes? As uh, we receive them, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. And now we've reached the consent agenda. Are there any items any trustee would like pulled from the consent agenda? Mr. Sean, please. Uh, BOE 41. Okay. 
Okay, I'll run in trouble with it. Uh, BOE 46. <laughs> Doctor. <laughs> you do that a lot. I, know, I do that a lot. I say Reverend Doctor. <laughs> I know. BOE 46. 46? Yeah. BOE 41. Okay. We did that already. Any others? A motion to accept the consent agenda minus BOE 41 and BOE 46. So moved. Second. Any discussion about that? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? Okay, we'll take them one at a time. BOE 41, it was pulled by two trustees. BOE 41. I'll move to BOE 41. Second it. Okay. Discussion. Mr. Charlotte? Um, well, I asked this to be pulled because I wanted to emphasize to the community that it's something that, first of all, it's something that we talked about at our last audit in the Finance Committee. Um, and it's a um, it's a resolution in support of community partnerships um, and Dr. Patalino's effort in holding an interagency conference on social and emotional issues concerning um, affecting students in the Kingston City School District. Uh, and as I mentioned when Mr. Clegg was speaking, I think the restorative justice uh, issue also affects the social emotional health of our students um, and and one thing that I would like to ask um, in carrying out this uh, interagency conference um, that you invite other school districts to participate in some way um, because a lot of the agencies that we will be inviting that would be invited to it uh, to the conference uh, have responsibilities uh, throughout the county and uh, and I think this is an issue that um, uh, affects every every district in the county and actually uh, schools throughout the country uh, I, th I think there's an increase uh, in the fragility of students um, attending high school and no comment. Yes. Uh, just to add, um, on top of and in, in part of what we do here in Kingston City School District, I think the idea of having a, a conference and bringing in agencies, I don't want to gloss over the fact that this is what we do. We have multiple partnerships. We have um, Student social and emotional um, health is part of, is ingrained in our DNA of what we do here in Kingston City School District through our curriculum, through our partnerships, and as we move forward with our, um, with our DTSDE, as you know, I keep talking about our tenants and things, like, it, it's woven into our tenants, and actually we have several uh, different programs, seven different pieces of our, our curriculum that are already addressing this. I think this is kind of, this is kind of icing on the cake, but we, we do this every day, and this, that's how we have to do it every day. We can have events, but we have to make sure that it's woven into what we do. And I actually ask um, Mrs. Bonville and Mrs. Uh, Gibbons to, they, they have a little, they put their a little together because they wanted to uh, participate in this, just to kind of give us a preview of our, our little glance of what we're doing. So Mrs. Bonville, if you would start. Yeah, actually, I think there's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Throw it over to me. Um, Along with uh, you know the presentation we had earlier today, you know we are looking at the social emotional support uh, system for our students, and using some of the tenets of PBIS, um, our our overarching theme is to be respectful, responsible, and ready to learn. And currently this year we're we're actually in action developing those systems within our schools. But just a few other, you were given a sheet that had some items on here, but just a few others uh, that, that we would like to point out. 
is that in our response intervention plan, we actually have an academic, social, emotional learning linkage. So there's even that built in there where our systems will really um, are tied in with our academics and our RTI, our three-tiered system that we have as well. Um, uh, Dr. Padalino, Mr. Verge, and I have met with the, the Ulster County Mental Health. When we're talking about what can we do to you know, extend that relationship. Uh, we had increases of social workers at both secondary and elementary schools last year, looking at some of the needs of our students, um, which kind of um, the high school social worker made it available for us to have a cohort model where our, you're, you're going to have an assistant principal, guidance counselor, so, social worker, school psychologist that will follow the kids each year to build that sort of community as well. We have a number of programs that are that have, uh, you know are in the high school around ther different behavioral therapies, uh, substance substance excuse me abuse, but one of the one things I will highlight is uh, we have a relationship with the uh, Institute of Family Health. We have a clinic in George Washington School, which grew to a second clinic at Miller Middle School, and right now we're wor working to open a clinic at the high school, and the clinic basically has a counseling piece. It also has a uh, physician's assistant or a doctor that comes in and deals with uh, medication management as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Mrs. Bonville to talk about secondary. Thank you. So as you know, um, you know, Dr. Catalina alluded to the fact that this is, you know, embedded in everything that we do. And, you know, certainly our DSIP, our um, District Comprehensive Improvement Plan, and our School Comprehensive Education Plans reflect that. Um, we have Tenant 5 um, SMART goals and action plans that reflect that um, the social emotional health really has its own place here um, in Kingston City School District. So in addition to the list of the community partners that um, Bill was just talking about and that you have in front of you, um, again they are aligned with Tenant 5 of the social emotional health. There are some additional partnerships and actually some of these partnerships we actually heard from already this year. Um, we had David Brownstein here from um, Wild Earth. He talked about the program that he did in Miller. We will be doing that again um, at Bailey. Um, certainly we had our um, Bruderhof with Breaking the Cycle of Violence that we have at the middle level. Um, Victor Woods um, was certainly aligned with Tenet 5 with um, you know, talking about um, you know, making good choices and, and you know, staying away you know, prevention from substance abuse and the like. Um, with extracurricular, we have things like empty bowls. We have Cornell Cooperative using um, STEM programs with their Tech Wizard program that we have, we have in both of our middle schools. Um, Mrs. Linton was here and did her uh, principal presentation and talked about the LLL program, the Life, Learning, and Language, the Young Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck program that we have um, that fosters you know, that sense of community and self-confidence and all of those qualities. Um, at KHS, we had the Bardavon this year, um, at the Rhapsody in Black performance. Um, we did have Victor Woods last year. Um, I believe Mrs. Heidecker did a story on Tay Fisher, was just at our ninth grade um, academy. Tay Fisher has also worked with our middle school students, as many of you are aware. Um, Bill talked about the Family Institute. We have them at Miller um, GW, and they're coming um, soon to a high school near you in January. Um, and we also have our Marist Liberty Partnership. And the Marist Liberty Partnership is really a pretty unique and, and rich experience for our students because it really deals with the whole child. Um, it is about the academia, but also about the social um, emotional aspect. Um, and then in addition to that, all of those things, of course we have our health curriculum. Um, we have that at grades six and seven at the middle school. And then of course at KHS, it's predominantly ninth and 10th, but it can be nine through 12. Um, talking about topics like community service, community building, um, stress management, healthy choices, nutrition, substance abuse prevention, and the like. And then we also have connections across all of our content areas. So if you were to go on and look at our curriculum maps, um, we have essential questions that drive our um, units and therefore our lessons. And I pulled just a very kind of short sampling of some of these essential questions um, and tried to kind of get a sampling across the board. Um, fifth grade ELA, one of the questions that we ask is what makes a person's rights universal? How do we uphold our individual rights and respect the rights of others? At sixth grade in FLEX, our FLEX program, why would reciprocating courtesies in relation to family be appropriate? That's pretty heavy. Um, tenth grade for Global 10, 
are conflicts between nations and or people inevitable? Um, 11th grade ELA, how do societal and familiar perceptions and values affect how we see ourselves? And then we talked about in a different voice a little earlier tonight, some of the questions they ask is what is the experience of women in various cultures throughout modern history? What is feminism? And so on. So certainly it is ingrained um, really in every, in every fabric of, in everything that we do. I don't think I really have to say anything because you saw a great example in our district <laughs> happenings, all of the students saying, you know, what their wishes were. And I was really impressed by their caring and concern about the culture. But um, the, it is pervasive throughout our whole elementary curriculum. It was written that way. Uh, the social emotional realm, <coughs> diversity, both currently and historically, because we know how the past drives the present and the future. It was written in there quite intentionally. Some of the topics, um, just like Ms. Sponville gave you some, I can say accepting others, being unique, standing up and facing bullies, conquering obstacles. What are dignity, respect, fairness, equality? How can I be a positive influence in the people of my world? And those are just a few. I, I had a list of about 50 things, and it was so hard to pick out the ones I wanted to highlight, and there's still more on my paper. but. Um, the curriculum is really chock full of those kinds of things that are meant for discussion, that are meant for teaching and, and learning. The school news, nurse teachers also teach health classes regarding safety, nutrition, um, HIV, child sexual abuse prevention. So there's a lot, and Mr. LaForester already talked, spoke about our social workers and psychologists and what they do. Uh, some of our partnerships, last year you heard about, it's not really a partnership, but uh, collaborations, partnerships, and programs. But last year, uh, one of the board meetings, there was a presentation on peace, peaceful school bus, and I'm pleased to report that it's even stronger this year. All the sc elementary schools are doing it, and the results from all the principals are saying it is making a big impact. Uh, we have reading volunteers, we have retired senior program, and not only do they provide academic, but that one-to-one -one really helps with the social emotional piece and having someone to relate to, someone to listen to. We have our Ulster Literacy Program supporting um, our ELL population, and more importantly, or as important, uh, their parents. So parents and the students can learn together, can work together, can become more part of the community. Um, YMCA partners with um, our mentoring for TOPS. Girls Inc. is at all levels, elementary, middle, and high. And what that is is a program that promotes through the YWCA. It promotes independence and success for women and um, obstacles that women may confront. Um, and our superintendent's conference days, we have social workers and psychologists meeting with community agencies so they can learn more about what is out there that we can access. So there's just so much going on. Um, the things that all three of us have just spoken about are only the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot more. It's definitely not an all-inclusive list. But uh, it is a goal of our staff, our teachers, our administration to really build that <coughs> social emotional understanding piece, diverse, um, diversity and understanding pervasive through everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. That is my comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, it was a very uh, enlightening uh, presentation or comment from Dr. Petalino. I'd like to say that uh, uh, that this board meeting marks the is the last uh, board meeting before Dr. Patalino's uh, fourth anniversary as, um, uh, as, as superintendent of schools. Uh, and I will say that before he became superintendent of schools, I never heard a discussion about social emotional health of our students. So I would like to congratulate him on introducing that uh, into our school system. I think it's tremendously important um, and will provide benefits to the community for many, many decades into the future. Uh, yes, 
I really appreciate what was presented here tonight. We knew we had a lot of collaboration. We had we knew we had a lot of partners in the community, but I didn't know that we had this many. And you said you just touched on a few of them. So I think that uh, uh, we're going in the right direction, and and a lot of good things are happening within our school district. And certainly, we give the credit to the administration and the teachers and the sector that makes these things happen. As well as our children. So we just want to say appreciate it. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, we have a motion and a second, and if there's no other discussion, all those in favor of BOE 41, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. The other resolution was pulled was BOE 46. I'll entertain a motion to approve BOE 46. So second. Okay, discussion. BOE 46. Um, I, just, I just wanted to make a comment about this. Um, I, this is something that, or this is a piece of something that we've been talking about for a long time in connection with the um, capital project at the high school. Um, and I just want to say that I, I, um, I feel that Mr. Clapper does a great job, and I know that he's a real asset to this district. Um, and I do feel that if he is working extra hours, he deserves to be compensated. I think that's important. Um, I'll also say that I have expressed my disagreement with how we've gone about this owner's rep function, and my concern is that we're kind of digging ourselves into a hole. Um, but that said, I think if Mr. Clapper is doing the work, then he deserves to be compensated for it. Um, and so I'm going to vote yes on this because I feel, and I, I know that makes it com seem contradictory to what I voted before, but I need to support the way that the board voted in the past. Um, or the will of the board, actually. And I do believe that Mr. Clapper deserves to be compensated for the work that he's doing. If he's doing it and doing such a good job of it. So I will be voting yes, even though it may seem like a contradiction. Any other discussion? Mr. Schultz? Um, so I would like to say that I uh, appreciate Dr. Jacobowitz's concern expressed in the past about, about this issue. Um, and um, I also appreciate uh, her attempt to vote this evening in, in support of it. Well, I would like to comment that I've had the pleasure of working with Mr. Klepper for five years with facilities, and I think he has made a tremendous change in the way, along with the support of this board and the administration, in the way that our buildings have been maintained and how we go about marshalling our limited resources to actually do the most good. So I want full support of this as well. Any other comment? All right, all those in favor of BOE 46, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstention. All right, that marks the end of the consent agenda, but we have a donation agenda. This is called your good arm and then test me so that we find it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. First time with this board. Um, okay. Uh, B73 is to accept a donation, uh, Harry L. Edson Elementary School. Whereas, whereas Ms. Rondi Brower of Blackwood and Brower Booksellers would like to donate the attached selection of books to the Harry L. Edson Elementary School Library, and whereas Dr. Paul Padalino, Superintendent of Schools, has reviewed the proposed donation and recommends acceptance of this donation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the City School District of Kingston, New York, does hereby accept, with grateful appreciation, the donation of library books from Ms. Rondi Brower. Thank you. All right. In favor of accepting the donation from Mary Ellison? Well, we just pray for accepting it, correct? We don't have to vote on that. No? Oh, we have to vote on it. Yes. We have to vote I need a motion. <coughs> All right, I need a motion. Accept the donation from Mary Ellison. So second. second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Yeah. Okay, and then we have the OE 42. No, that's right. Okay. 
Which brings us to the Board of Education. Can I make one comment before we move um, forward? Okay. Uh, I do, there, we did, um, the board did grant tenure to two of our teachers today. Um, I see that Heidi Malinsky is here, a social worker at the Edson School, and I want to congratulate her on uh, receiving tenure. Uh, we appreciate the hard work you've done over the last three years you've been here. Um, and as I say, whenever we give tenure, tenure isn't given, it's earned, and you've earned it. Uh, I know because I just said so many nice things about Mr. Krupp that you wouldn't have gotten tenure if you didn't earn it. So uh, I know that you did, and I can feel confident that uh, Mr. Krupp has been uh, a um, kind but forceful mentor. Um, <laughs> so congratulations and thank you. to the Board of Education Copying Conversation. Copying Conversation was held yesterday at Barnes & Noble. And um, <coughs> we had three people who came and spoke. Um, Dr. Schobowitz and I were the trustees present. Um, there, was also, there were also several trustees speaking to the Commissioner of Education down at New Pulse um, simultaneously. So we were spread around the county yesterday. Um, some issues came up that we're going to address a little bit later in new business, so I don't know if we want to go into them deeply right now. So, um, the next coffee and conversation, uh, we'll announce yeah. now. So now. I, I should know this at the top of my head. Yeah, I don't I? think we have anyone signed up for it. No, we don't. January 14th at Monkey Joe's at 8 a.m. Is there any trustee who would volunteer. Like to volunteer for Monkey Joe's at 8 a.m. on January 14th? That's a Thursday? That is a Thursday. <coughs> Thursday. I could probably do that. Okay, Mr. Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will do it. I will be there also. Okay. Thank you. May I join Mr. Sean? <laughs> sure. <laughs> They have enough tables. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And audit finance. Thank you. Audit and finance, Mr. Shaughnessy. Um, the finance, uh, the audit and finance committee met on uh, November 24th. Um, we uh, reviewed the treasurer's reports for October of 2015 uh, and the claims auditor report for. Um, October 2015. So those, uh, the acceptance of those is recommended in BOE 43 and BOE 44. So can I move those together? Um, A second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Abstention. Um, we also reviewed. Um, three corrective action plans which were included in the consent agenda. Uh, those corrective action plans were for uh, <coughs> the external audit which was presented to the board um, the first meeting in November, I believe, um, and the um, extra classroom activity funds. Uh, and we also had a corrective action plan for our internal auditor on the uh, <coughs> stack system. Stack is uh, student tracking and something system. Um, but since we did have an audit, we had to have a corrective action plan. Um, and we also uh, reviewed the charters for new uh, extra curricular activities at both the high school and the middle schools and review the um, submission of uh, officers and uh, uh, faculty advisors for all of the uh, uh, extracurricular groups at Kingston High School and at Miller and at Bailey and uh, those were approved uh, also in the consent agenda which we already handled. Uh, our next meeting will be uh, Tuesday, December 24th, I believe. Uh, it's December 22nd. 
at 9 a.m. Thank you. Policy, Mrs. Collins. Uh, the policy committee met on Friday, December 4th. We had quite a lengthy agenda. We um, reviewed about five or six different policies, most of which will be in the pipeline for first readings in January. Um, tonight we have on the agenda policy 8334, which is use of credit and payment cards. And um, this policy was brought forth by Mr. Olson and by um, Mrs. Legac in the business office. And because it would really help expedite things as far as using these cards, um, we'd like to waive the first reading and go right to adoption tonight. So do I have to move it? So I'd like to move policy 8334. All the parameters for the use of the cards are, are listed there. It's really the use of district credit cards. Um, when you cannot use a, a purchase order. So I'd like to move 8334. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Right. <coughs> Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstention. Okay. And I just looked at the calendar. The first Friday in January is January 1st, so I doubt we'll be doing that. Unless you want to. Uh, so I. Uh, I assume it would be meeting on January 8th, but uh, we'll put that out. Football at your house. Yes. We, we could go over that as a first. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've reached old business. Uh, is there any old business any trustee would like to raise at this moment? All right. Okay, nothing new business. We have two resolutions um, to entertain a new business. I'm going to take them one at a time. Uh, Resolution BOE 48. Be resolved that the board hereby directs the issuance of the following public statement that shall also be communica communicated to all local law enforcement agencies, be posted on the district's website and social media accounts, and prominently displayed at the entrances to every district building and sports venue. While the Ulster County Sheriff has advised all county residents who are licensed to carry a firearm to arm themselves, it is important to know that weapons are prohibited from being in the possession of students, faculty, and all other individuals on school grounds, in school buildings, or other school facilities unless they have the express written permission of the superintendent of schools. The New York State Penal Law makes it a felony to possess a rifle, shotgun, or firearm on school grounds. Section 265.01 Penal Law, A, I'm sorry, of Penal Law. And it is also illegal to possess spring guns, air guns, or CO2 cartridge guns on school grounds. Anyone found to possess such weapons on school grounds without authorization from the superintendent of schools shall be reported to the police authorities. I'll entertain a motion. I move it. Second. Okay, any discussion on that? Uh, not at this point. Mr. Shaughnessy. Um, I think that this is a very important resolution for us to adopt. Um, we're coming up to school concerts and uh, indoor athletic events, basketball games uh, that bring big crowds of people to our schools. And uh, you know, I disagree with Sheriff Dan Blarklum's Barclum's uh, suggestion that uh, uh, that residents should carry firearms, uh, they certainly don't make me uh, feel safe. Um, and, uh, and not that I, and I don't carry one, I wouldn't. Um, but I think that, I think that this, we need to emphasize right now that they're not allowed in school property because it's likely that someone will attempt to come to a district event uh, with a firearm. Um, and uh, I think we need to strongly let everyone know that that's not permitted. Any other comments? Uh, I would say Shana? ditto to what Mrs. Shaughnessy say. I, I really do believe that we need to, a lot of times we think that the solution to our problems is to go wah-wah west with more guns. Uh, 
and I don't agree with that. And I think that it's not good for our community to uh, to everybody bringing guns and trying to solve it. We had an opportunity to uh, go to the police academy where they're training, and police are trained how to act responsibly in an emergency situation, and it takes quite a bit of training to do that. And for the average citizen, they're not prepared to do that type of thing. And I just think it would be dangerous for our school, for our children to, to be in an environment where everybody who can and is licensed to carry a gun is in there with a gun. We don't know what would happen. So it's good to let the community know what the laws are concerning school, and they cannot uh, carry those weapons on our system without the approval of superintendent. Thank you, Reverend I strongly disagree with the uh, suggestion of the sheriff. I think it's a, it's a dangerous thing for him to suggest everybody that has firearms carry them. And I'm going to certainly vote for in favor of this resolution. Thank you, Reverend Anyone else, Reverend? Oh, yeah, I would like to see uh, uh, why it took us so long to have a policy like this, you know. And then the one thing that everybody knows in life that you don't fight, fight, fight fire with fire. So keeping the guns away from our school building is the safest way to go. Okay, anyone else? All those in favor of BOE 48, please signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstentions. Which brings us to BOE 49. Um, I'll read the resolution and entertain a motion. Be it resolved that the Board of Education, in the interest of the safety and welfare of the students, faculty, employees, and others present at the Kingston High School, hereby expresses its opposition to the establishing of a shooting range and gun store in close proximity to the Kingston High School campus. And be it further resolved that the district clerk is directed to send a copy of this resolution to the mayor, the common council, and the planning board of the city of Kingston. Entertain a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor of the OE 49? Yes. There was, I'm I, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Um, I'm. I am um, very glad that we were able to pull this resolution together. I think it's very important. Um, I think it would be unwise for us to have a shooting range and gun store in such proximity to our high school, um, and also so close to the Y. Um, and I am um, very glad that we were able to pull this together. Any other discussion? All right, I, well. I agree with that. I, I agree with Dr. Kikova with the statement. I, I, I've thought about this. I've been asked by various people to go to the planning meeting on, I think it's Monday evening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I will try to do so and uh, speak my own opinion that way as well. I, I agree with what I was going to say. All right. All those in favor of BOE 49, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Okay. We'll move. And with that, we're on to board member announcements. Are there any uh, announcements that any board member would like to make at this moment? Mr. Shaughnessy. Um, well, first I'd like to ask uh, maybe the, the uh, Freeman can have an article about our resolutions that we just passed on uh, not printing guns in schools. Uh, secondly, uh, Friday and Saturday night, the uh, Mendelssohn Choir is uh, having its annual Christmas concert at Old Dutch Church uh, at 8 p.m. on each evening. And uh, this year, uh, We'll have three groups from Kingston High School, um, the choir, uh, the, the uh, brass ensemble, uh, and, the, uh, and some string, uh, the string group. Uh, we'll all be performing. Uh, uh, so and I invite anyone in the community. I, I think it will be a, uh, a nice evening of entertainment. Yes, yes uh, on Tuesday, uh, we went to New Paltz at BOCES to listen to the Commission of Education. And uh, I, I thought it was uh, 
Well, you got really the impression that she really wants to uh, impact education and make some, some viable changes to, to make things better. She talked about the four, she calls it four bu buckets where, of issues that are important uh, that she saw since she's traveled about 17,000 miles over the state, uh, visiting um, the various school districts and et cetera, talking to not only uh, the superintendents, administrators, teachers, and students, but also some parents. And uh, she talked in terms of uh, that one of the issues that has to be dealt with, of course, is the issue on the standards or the Common Core. And she said that they had put out a survey uh, which allowed um, any number of people uh, to participate in, and I think that she indicated uh, that there was like 10,500 responses uh, on the uh, survey, and that basically uh, what came out is there's some suggestions that's come for how it can be made, the standards could be made better uh, and improved, uh, but that uh, after all the responses and comments that probably 71% were positive on the standards and that there has to be some work done to to improve them, but she's working on that and feels that's something that we have to do. Uh, and she's putting together a team uh, of, of people who will take the feedback from the survey and uh, will then work on various issues that were raised relative to the survey to try to improve on, on the standards. And the um, second thing she talked about was curriculum. And uh, one of the things she pointed out is that a lot of people uh, took the curriculum that was done by Engage New York and just took it as if this is a script and everybody has to follow it, said that was not the intention. And of course things weren't rolled out as well as they should be, but that again she felt that the curriculum should be what I think we've done here in, in our school district, and that is to, to take uh, the standards and then to take the curriculum and, and develop it within our own district. And she uh, was sort of recommending that 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 be done, and that she's going to set up a teacher's portal uh, so that uh, materials can be put on there that the teachers can use, and the local t uh, teachers should be developing their own curriculum, and it shouldn't be scripted, it should be what they feel they need in order to do the important work they do in the classroom. She also spoke on testing, and uh, she's made some changes there. She's heard very clearly the uh, comments that come from uh, from the people all over the state and so uh, they've changed the company that's going to prepare the test. She's shortened the, the time that would be spent on the test and um, they're taking a look at IEPs, students, so that uh, they'll get what they need, the time that they need. And she also pointed out uh, that uh, in the test, uh, if a child's taking the test and they need more time, that they're going to work some way so that can happen because it's not about trying to get it done at a certain time, but it's trying to find out how much you know and how much you're able to, uh, they're able to give back. And so if they're uh, actively and productively working on the test, that something could be done there. Whether that's resolved or not, I don't know. And then the final thing she talked about was the evaluation of teachers. And basically, uh, she didn't say much there. She recognizes that that's a problem and um, Something's got to be done there, but I don't, she didn't have a solution there. Uh, I think there's a lot of moving parts in that, and uh, uh, something's got to be done. And so that was it. Thank you very much, Ron. Yeah. Quickly, I too attended and did a great summary. So I just, um, just in general, Commissioner Elias seems much more receptive, and I think it's because she's a teacher. Um, it comes from the trenches, shall we say, and almost everything that you said are things that I had highlighted in my notes. Um, but she seemed to acknowledge a lot, which was much different than the previous regime, to say there was a lack of curriculum. Her quote, the sequencing was at too fast a pace to acknowledge we needed a new testing company. Um, I like the fact that she said they might use uh, adaptive technology for special education students, or as you said, if they're work working actively on the test to be humane and allow these children to continue. But there are two quotes that I just wanted to highlight that I wrote down that she had said. Um, you're right, I didn't see anything specific about teacher evaluation, but she did say, we need constant involvement of our teachers in the system. 
I'm hopeful. That's true. And she says, I can't take away the ill will and the problems that have occurred before. So once again, acknowledging that and moving forward. But I thought it was great that she came to Newport. She spoke with superintendents, administrators. She spoke with parents, and she spoke with a group of school board members. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Reporting out on that. And now we've reached public participation. A second session. If there's anyone who would like to approach the podium, you're limited to two minutes. Um, our board clerk will let you know when you're approaching two minutes, and it's not a conversation, so we're just here to listen. Yes, yeah, so my name is Jennifer Schwartz Berkey. Um, thank you for the second part of public participation. I was at the county legislature uh, as a legislator elect uh, for District 7, which is in Kingston, and so I'll be starting in January. So uh, a lot of meetings. Um, but I wanted to let all of you know that as an urban planner and as a, an advisor to kingstoncitizens.org, I've been working closely with a number of concerned citizens about the shooting range. Um, and we've discussed what approach we should use in terms of appealing to the planning board, whether it's on a matter of public safety, environmental hazards, um, property values, um, worker um, safety. Uh, there are a number of issues that come up in, the, in uh, shooting ranges, including that the CDC reports that suicides occur at shooting ranges, that the sale of guns will occur at the shooting range, that the rental of guns with unchecked background um, unchecked background uh, being available and that 70% of all use at shooting ranges is from rentals. So obviously this is a matter of great public concern to many people in the community and we're grateful for your resolution. I also wanted to say that the planning board may have a discretionary decision to make because the zoning isn't entirely clear on whether it is an allowed use. Uh, that's open to some interpretation and we may be asking them to bring it at the public hearing on Monday to the Zoning Board of Appeals to review. So I have only a few seconds remaining, but I will keep you posted on the way that we're pursuing this, even though I know that some of you are going to appear at the hearing, and perhaps we can discuss between now and then uh, a unified approach in the community. So okay, thank you. Question. The public meeting, what time is it? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I think it's 6 o'clock. Six okay, six yes. So it's a, as I said, it's a public hearing, and everybody gets three minutes there. Um, and if you want to learn more, we're posting things on kinstoncitizens.org so that you can follow some of the legal and um, uh, literature, uh, for example, uh, literature across the country about these issues. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Mrs. Zephron? Um, yes, I jotted a few notes with me. So, first of all, I, I'd like to say thank you for um, having the presentation about the restorative justice issues this evening. Um, that's a topic, as I'm sure you know, is being discussed in many different venues, um, and I've had an opportunity to participate in some of them. And, um, and I did just want to let you know, if you are not aware of some of the different things going on in the um, area, Citizens Action is working on this topic very extensively. Um, uh, the Kingston um, High School Parents Association, we actually, um, in, through some of the work when we were planning for the HOPE 2015 conference, um, were actually bringing in some presentations for that. And we actually, last Thursday, when that conference didn't come about, we had a presentation that Family of Woodstock actually has two programs, and I don't know if you know about them, the 180 program and the STSJP programs that are very much in that venue. And I didn't actually realize until they presented them that, that those actually were not already implemented in our school district. So please definitely investigate those programs. Um, and please do um, include parents very early on. Um, there are a lot of issues that parents and students would be very happy to tell you about, concerns with regards to um, the suspensions, concerns, um, I'm, and even from just, I don't know if you know, that actually um, students can be suspended because they have missed too much school. And so they're missing more school because they've missed school. And, um, and so there we have definitely problems there. Um, so um, please uh, do get parents involved. I'm glad to hear about the, um, the uh, community forums um, opportunities there. There's lots of great things I know I've learned about as we've been 
uh, planning some of the parent opportunities. And again, please keep parents involved so that we're aware. Um, the meeting with uh, Commissioner Elia, just to, so that you do aware, there was another survey by New York State Allies for Public Education. 12, over 12,000 people responded in a week's time, and 70% actually were opposed to the Common Core State Standards. Uh, so a little different results than the Commissioner's survey. Um, so lots going on. Thanks. Thank you. I will be brief. My name is Maureen Bowers. I just wanted to thank the board and congratulate the board. This was a great meeting. A lot of really good discussion of what is really at the heart of what we do, and that is to worry about our students and teach them, and not only academically, but socially and emotionally. And it was great to hear Mr. Clegg's presentation and then all of what all of you had to say, and I applaud your proactiveness. If that's a word, I'm not sure, but anyway, you know what I mean, your proaction on those last two resolutions that you passed, so thank you. Um, I just want to thank, my name is Jamila Reed. I have a son that's 11 years old, and he goes to Bailey Middle School. And I really want to thank the teachers for going above and beyond. My son has a mood disorder. He has an IEP. He's autistic. And he's a little Asbergery. But the teachers at Bailey have gone above and beyond. On December 4th, my son went to school. He went to his one-on-one. -on -one. He said, I'm having a bad day. I text the teacher at 7 o'clock saying, heads up. My son's having a bad day. He turned it around. My, son, my husband played basketball with him. Make a long story short, another student called him a name and he hit the student. I left my office at 8.30 and immediately I went to the middle school. I begged the principal to not suspend my child for five days. My son gets all A's and B's. And I, I cried. I said, my husband is an owner operator. He's a truck driver. Please, I'll do, if he gets into any more trouble, I promise you, please keep my son. She says, nope, I'm not going to do it. And I just began to, to just cry because I was, I just felt, I didn't feel any compassion or anything. The statistics are correct. My son was getting all A's and B's. When I left my house, he was doing okay. his homework with my I, husband. I'm, I'm going to stop you there because now you're getting into personnel. Oh, okay. And we don't discuss individual personnel okay, at a so public meeting. If you want to speak with the superintendent or the assistant superintendent of human resources, you, you may make an appointment. Okay. But so is not at a, no. Okay, so it, I just stopped talking? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I know you have a concern, but yes. Yeah, yeah, so I just, but I do want to say the teachers are amazing. Amazing. They spend the time. They, they go above and beyond. My only problem is when I beg to keep my son in school, and Thank they you. said. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. but you, you need to go through the proper channels. I, I know it's, it's. Frustrating, but okay. Anyone else? Since we have no need for a second public session, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Okay. I think I can vote. Uh, yeah. Can you say no? I mean, no. I have no idea. Huh? Yeah, you did. Just exempt? Uh, there's a shutdown. That's how people get hurt, you know. Rock off. What do you mean you're only going to get a few? What does that mean?